Open your Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, and we'll be starting in verse 13. I'm going to call this uh, Get an Appraisal. Get an Appraisal. That's something that people that receive gifts, jewelry, and buy stuff, and they want to know the exact worth it's, uh, or other items. Sometimes you go to an independent appraiser rather than just set, accept the word of the jeweler who's selling it to you and telling you how much it's worth. Uh, I've gone, I, I remember going for an appraisal once on a diamond ring that my wife wanted to trade in. And uh, yeah, and Macy's at that time in New York, Macy's on 34th Street was uh, known as the most reputable place with the most accurate appraisals, believe it or not, in their jewelry department. I don't know if this is still the case. This was a long time ago. But uh, I, I, I've i got this title, Get an Appraisal, because recently the Queen of England died and, uh, and the flowing tributes nonstop ad nauseum. They go on and on and on about her record of service and 70 years on the throne and all of that. And whenever someone famous dies, I always have the question, first of all, unless I know for sure, were they saved? Were they born? Not were they religious? Were they moral? Were they civic-minded? The idea is you're saved or you're lost. There's two categories. Was that individual born again? Uh a lot of people don't, they don't like it when I bring this up. Oh, she was a great woman. I don't know. I'm talking about an appraisal from the Lord. I went to Macy's for an accurate appraisal. If I wanted an appraisal on someone's life, I would expect the Lord to have the most accurate appraisal, a true appraisal. He knows the quality of that person's life, what they accomplished or didn't accomplish. So she served 70 years. Did I ever hear her confess Christ as her Savior? No. Did I ever hear her mention anything about born again? No. As head of the, uh, the Great Britain and the Commonwealth, she was also known as the defender of the faith. She was the head of the Church of England. She took an oath to defend the faith. Well, what happened? <laughs> when pressure started to mount about uh, putting... Uh, females in as pastors and leaders and bishops, she okayed it. Was she a defender of the faith in that regard? When there was pressure put on the Church of England, which she's the head of, to, uh, to marry homosexuals, did she defend the faith and say marriage is, is honorable and all and the bed is undefiled? No, she went along with it. And her bishops that are in the House of Lords, see, a lot of people don't understand the British system. You have the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Commons is where the real power is. And the House of Lords is just basically a rubber stamp body. You don't get elected to the House of Lords. You get appointed. And who's, who's in the House of Lords? Clergymen, bishops, barons, dukes, earls, all the so-called nobility of England gets a seat uh, or tries to get the queen to give him a seat in the House of Lords. Did anybody in the House of Lords raise any objection to the changes that were happening in the faith once delivered to the saints? Did anyone contend for that faith like it says in Jude 3? Not that I know of. So what's her appraisal before the Lord? What it says here in Luke 13, starting, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Luke, Luke 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Was she a servant of the Lord as a defender of the faith? Everyone's talking about her service to England, her service to her people. Well, England and the people of England are created. They're not the creator. The service we must render is the one who gave us life and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which she had as a professing Christian. Now it says in verse 15, look carefully. And he said unto them, 
Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. He's talking about the Pharisees. But God knoweth your hearts. Here it is. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. All this praise that's going to be lavished now, the funeral is going to happen a few days, all, everybody commenting about how wonderful she was and devoted to, the, uh, to her nation. Well, sure, she was the queen. Devoted. A absolutely, yes. Moral character. Well, I don't know. I'm sure it was beyond reproach. She did have family issues, though. A couple of her children got divorced. And this uh, Prince Andrew guy was hooked up with that sex maniac that wound up killing himself in that New York prison. What was his name? Jeffrey Epstein or something. So she's had some real issues to deal with in her family. Uh, that doesn't mean she wasn't saved. She might have been saved. I heard somebody the other day in the news say, well, yes, she was saved because we always pray, God save the Queen. God Singing a song the national anthem of Great Britain, which is God save the queen, doesn't save her. Amen? When, when that soul, that wonderful soul, already well past 90, uh, left, d did it travel straight to heaven? Somebody said she went off, well, the son, Prince Charles, said she went off to be with uh, her husband, Prince Philip. Does he know? How does he know? Or did it go into hell, where the Lord might say to her at the white at the white throne judgment, a thousand years after the millenn a thousand years after the Lord rules the earth, and He has the white throne judgment, depart from me. What? What do you mean, Lord? We we preach in your name. I was the defender of the faith. I took the oath of the crown when I became queen, 1952. You mean you don't know me? No, I, don't, we, I never knew you. Well, how's that? I never knew you. Were you born again? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? And if you did, did you ever mention me? Did you magnify my word? Did you tell your subjects, and you had millions of them, about salvation in Jesus Christ? Not the Church of England? not the so-called ordinances or sacraments of the Church of England. What is, it? what is the Anglican Church anyway? It's the Catholic Church without the wine. Uh, what is it? It's the Catholic Church without the wafer. It's, essentially, it's almost the same thing. So I'm looking at this situation now with everybody, you, you know, the whole country there is in mourning. And sure, they miss their queen. Now what do they got? They got Prince Charles III. They got uh, King Charles III. The king. Has anybody looked up the lives of the first two Charleses? One, Charles I and Charles II? Both of them, disasters. Disasters. <laughs> so <laughs> Charles III might be the last, you know, strike three and you're out. He might be the last king of England, as far as I know. Uh, well, his son will succeed him. He's already 72, I believe. Or is he older? I'm not sure. I have to check that. But I know his first fall, his, uh, the first, Charles I, was beheaded by Oliver Cromwell as he was moving the, the, uh, the Church of England. He was moving everybody in England back to Catholicism without batting an eye. And the Puritans under, under uh, Oliver Cromwell uh, said that's enough for him. They, they considered him basically a traitor to the oath of office. They got rid of him. And then you had uh, Charles II. Whoa, it's another disaster. They, the, the, after Cromwell died and Cromwell's son briefly took over, but he wasn't much good. The English thought it was proper to restore the monarchy. If you don't know this, you could look it up. Google it, Charles II, and he was a, you read about him, and it's, it's horrible. He was a flim-flam artist, and uh, a guy that liked his women and whatever, and he was moving the Church of England and uh, everyone closer uh, to the Roman Catholic Church. He married a Catholic woman, and he had close contacts with Spain and, and France and the Catholics there, and uh, he was moving England step by step back into a Catholic position. And uh, in fact, he confessed Catholicism on his deathbed, supposedly. 
He said, I'm a ca-. he was secretly a Catholic before that, but he openly, publicly professed Catholicism when he was about to die. So uh, he followed in his uh, fa- father's, uh, for- no, it was his brother. Charles II was the brother of Charles I. So now you've got Charles III. We'll see where he goes. And based on certain uh, statements he made while he was, uh, quote, the Prince of Wales, unquote, they all get these titles, you know. <laughs> now you know why George Washington <laughs> and the revolutionaries that followed him, they didn't want a king. He refused to be crowned king. Did you know that after this uh, Revolutionary War was over and he was uh, at Francis Tavern here in downtown New York, uh, not far from where I worked, on Pearl Street, in fact. There's a museum there, Continental War Museum. He said he gave his farewell address to his offices uh, saying goodbye and thank you and all of that, and then rode off to uh, his home in Mount Vernon, uh, Virginia. Uh, but they wanted to make him king. They said, no, he says, this is what we went to war for. We don't need a king. We're a republic. We don't want a monarchy. We don't need that stuff. The nobles and the dukes and the titles and all of that stuff. We don't need. And thank God, his uh, Thomas Jefferson had enough sense to realize we don't need a national church like the Church of England. People ran away from that stuff to come here. They ran away from the Church of England and the Church of the Church of Scotland and the Church of the Netherlands, the Dutch Reformed Church, which was here before the English got here. When I grew up in Brooklyn, there were not a lot of Dutch Reformed churches going all the way back to when uh, Brooklyn was actually five Dutch towns, believe it or not. <laughs> the Dutch had settled the whole area and the whole Hudson area all the way up to Albany, which was called Fort Orange then. Until the English took it over, they changed it uh, uh, from Fort Orange to Albany and New York was New Amsterdam until the English took it over. Thank God without firing the shot. And if they didn't take it over, maybe I'd be speaking Dutch. Who knows? Uh, So people ran away from that stuff, thank God. But in England, they have it. And if you didn't go along with the Church of England, you were called a dissenter, a dissenter. Whether you were a Quaker or or a Baptist or something, you were a dissenter. And uh, you had trouble. You had trouble as a dissenter, believe me. And then there were the Puritans. Now, the Puritans went to an extreme. The Puritans went to an extreme and and abolished everything that had any connection whatsoever to Catholicism or secularism. They were very... uh, But they were one of the reasons King James called for the the King James Bible at the Hampton Conference. What was that? 1604. 1604. He got the Puritans, the Church of England people, all these scholars together and said, come on. Come on, produce one final authority. One final authority for everyone in the kingdom. And seven years later, 1611, imagine that, seven years later, they produced the authorized King James Version. But in England at the time, you were either Church of England, a a Puritan, or a dissenter. And Charles II tried to keep peace with all three groups and naturally failed and died a failure. But you got to look that up and Google it. And why am I saying that? Well, now they're singing God Save the King. And from everything I've ever read about Prince Wales, uh, the Prince of Wales, he's as lost as a goose himself. I never heard him confess Christ. I never heard him magnify the word of God. In fact, one time in a public comment, he backed off the title that he now has as king, defender of the faith, he mumbled something about a defender of the faiths. In other words, I represent a lot of different people with a lot of... See that? He, he wouldn't allow himself to be narrowed down as the defender of the faith because the title of the defender of the faith was part of the car, was in the coronation oath. You were sworn to uphold the Protestant religion. You were sworn to uphold the faith, which is God saves by grace not works, and Romanism is not of God. If you read the old common uh, common prayer book of the Church of England, of the Church of England, the, they have a book, the, the common prayer book. I don't know if the, it's, I'm sure it's been revised from when it first came out. But did you know initially the common prayer book had said that the mass is a blasphemous delusion and a dangerous deceit? 
That's how they describe the Roman Catholic Mass, a blasphemous delusion and a dangerous deceit. You think any king of England or anybody in, in, in prominent in England is going to say something like that? To defend the faith is to turn around and say, what we have is right and what the Roman church has is a blasphemous delusion and a dangerous deceit. You think anybody's going to say that? I don't think so. So when people talk about, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men, yes, the monarchy in England, absolutely, the queen, the king, the whole thing. When that which is for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. How about that? Is anybody going to say that to, to somebody who's mourning her death? Somebody who wants to attend the funeral or something? No, no, don't count on it. Oh, don't hold your breath. Brother Robert Militello has no hesitation saying these things. Why? I believe God's word. I call it the way he calls it. If he gives me light to see how he calls it, I call it that way. I don't go along with man's opinion or what man feels like it or wants to feel. I couldn't care less about that. But those, even Christians, who are still part, very much a part of this world, still have strong feelings. You know, oh, Brother Militello, why do you have to be so crude on this? I mean, she was a wonderful woman. Was she? Let the Lord make the final decision. Amen? Amen.